If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of your favorite podcast, Mind Pump. We took a laugh. I know it's your favorite. We had a good time. We talked about aftershave, uh, toothpaste. Yeah, why does it burn? Tiger Balm and the perception of benefit. Don't put it on your balls. Yeah, we talked mm, about uh, pain. Like, what is pain? And sometimes there's not a physical reason for feeling I think physical it's in your pain. Mind. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Doesn't mean it's not real. I see dead people. We talk about it. <laughs> uh, we talked about um, some cool experiments that d- demonstrate how the body can perceive certain things. And then we get into some pretty interesting conversation about contest prep. Should you even compete? Yeah, the the the, the damage people put their bodies through. Um, we talk about what people do with exercise. The 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 big nose, like the big things that people do that tend to slow their metabolisms down. A little recap and, on the San Jose Pro Show. Yeah, we talk a little bit about that. Um, and the metabolic damage differences between men and women. There is a difference. Mm. Also, this month, our biggest promotion yet, uh, we're actually doing a buy one, get one free promotion. It's our first time ever. Enroll in the MAPS Super Bundle, which is about a year's worth of exercise programming. It's got MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, Maps Anywhere and Maps Prime. So basically, you follow them in succession. It's and a cornucopia you, of maps. And you use the Prime, Maps Prime to kind of pre prime and post prime your workouts. That's all put together in a bundle and it's discounted greatly. Well, if you enroll in that, you get one for free. So you can do this like with a friend, a family member, your spouse. It's freaking awesome. Th- to find out more about this, go to mindpumpmedia.com. I feel, uh, feel cool. Feel cool. Like cool air on my face. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just blasted. I haven't... Uh, blasted breeze. I haven't shaved my face in yeah. like a year. And... Uh, Did you put um, aftershave on it? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, the burning one? I love doing that, yeah. Just slap it on your face? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Ah! Oh. What's the deal with that? Yeah, I like, don't know. What's the, what's the thought process like the, like, behind that? Like, like it's well, going to... Like it has to burn. Yeah. It does burn. I know yeah, that. Yeah, but, yeah, but like what? But, it's, it's supposed but, to help. But let me ask you guys this. It's like the alcohol on your open Well, I know pores. why. I know yeah. why it burns. I don't think I'm putting liquid fire on my face. <laughs> no, but is that really what is necessary? This That's it. What yeah. I, what is it I, necessary? Or is exactly. it just like a pain that we've always tolerated? Like, oh, yeah, it should. you should burn. It makes me wonder if like when you put the aftershave on. Yeah. If it doesn't burn, I don't know about you guys, but back when I used to shave, if it didn't burn, I was like, this is bullshit. I'm like, this is not the, I'm going to buy another guy. Yeah, I didn't go close yeah. enough. It yeah. had to burn my face well, it's, it's <laughs> to this, be real. It's but, this, but does it? No, I don't think so. Yeah. It's the same concept as uh, toothpaste that bubbles up. And stuff. I know, they put detergent in your yeah, toothpaste. Yeah, the more it bubbles up, the oh, this must Ooh, be working. It's frothy. Nice and, and frothy. And soap on your body, right? Yeah, like yeah. you get soap that like lathers up. You're like, oh, it's working good. It's lathering up. Do you know how many people- they tricked us all. You know how many people like are losing their minds right now just realizing what you said? Because like same thing, all of them, shampoo, yes. like soap, toothpaste- the suds do mean nothing. Nothing. It doesn't mean you're getting. It's, it's more it's effective. Pure, just somebody figured out a way to market it. Better. Or like when you get like um, uh, shampoo. You ever get your hair washed at the? Salon? I know we have an old listener that knows where that started. That came from. <laughs> There's somebody who's like 70 who's like, yeah. I remember. Shout out to Doug's neighbor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> somebody know. knows this. Doug uh, should know this. Why did they do that? Why? Yeah. Where did that come from? And it, it, I wonder if it all started at the same time. I wonder if uh, bars of soap, shampoo, toothpaste, and uh, the aftershave all put it together around the same time. Like it was like an A company. It might. You know, it's it's funny yeah. because like Old Spice figured it out. They're yeah, like, this is probably Old make, Spice. Yeah, they're people like, like to feel stuff. Brute. They have to yeah. feel something for to yeah. feel like it's working. Yeah, right. it's true. Dude, the, the true like, old man like smell is brute. It's the science behind fucking pre workouts. <laughs> yes, it is. it is. I mean, they put fucking <laughs> niacin, cat, all the shit that makes you feel all hot and tingly and flush. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. like, it's like, what is it really burning fat, or does it just make you feel? Oh my god, that's probably what's in that. Uh, you know, when you have flakes like dandruff flakes, like you have the dandruff shampoo, it like burns. Yes, I bet you they just put it in there to make it feel like it burns. Yep. Yes, all yep. tingly. Yep. Those fuckers. So you know when you go to the salon and they wash your hair and it feels like cool. You're like, yeah. oh, it feels the tingle. It means it's working. They just put a little menthol in there. Damn it. It's not really doing shit for you. Ah. But feeling, feeling cool, sneaky bastard, and nice. Yeah, we want to feel stuff. We're and, all a bunch uh, of suckers. So I remember yeah. about uh, maybe 15 years ago, 14 years ago, there was this 
topical cream that you could buy. And Kevin, of all people, Kevin Lavroni was promoting it at the time. And you put it on the top. Oh, God. I just saw yes. this literally yesterday. This The old guy, you know, the old Mr. Olympia guys are the ones that are. I just saw a page with um, Flex Wheeler and his buddy. And I can't think of his name right now. He goes all the way back to Arnold times. And he's still competing. And uh, he was talking to Flex at Olympia. And he had the cream, you know. Rubbing the cream on your biceps to get a pump and stuff, and I was just like, get so, wow. so get this out cream, of here! With so that. this cream was you, exactly that. You rub it like, oh, I'm going to work my biceps today, so I'm going to rub it on my bicep to mm. get a better pump in my bicep. And what's in the cream is capsaicin, capsaicin. I hope I'm saying it right, which is the active ingredient in pepper. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was arginine. Of course, I have to sprinkle a little arginine because it's going to give you a better pump. Doesn't really work that way. Um, and then something else in it that basically makes your skin. Red. So when you put it on, you get like this red. You feel it. Wherever you put it, you'll get this like red, like like not rash, but like swollen effect on your skin. Mm-hmm. And and here's what's funny about that. It's like irritating your skin. Yeah. If you're really going to get a better pump on your bicep, putting it directly on your bicep is not going to help because it's not going to go to your bicep. It's become systemic. You're, if you you're were targeting to, it, bro. Yeah, if you were to absorb anything through the skin that way, which you're not going to absorb organine necessarily that way. Mm. But uh, hilarious, right? Because yeah. I remember buying. I actually bought That's it. Good. I actually yeah. fell for it because uh, <laughs> rubbing it all over the place. <laughs> yeah, dude. So <laughs> Sal rubbing on his dick. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, He's just jacking it. I, like, yeah. I want to get a yeah. pump. Yeah. There. <laughs> Things are happening. I didn't know capsaicin burn. No. <laughs> but uh, no, I rubbed it on my arms and I worked out, and they just got really hot and red. <laughs> and I remember. I remember thinking like, this is. Bullshit! What the fuck did I just do? <laughs> this doesn't feel good at all. How many stupid things did we try growing up, trying to try oh, to get man. a better pump or build more muscle? <laughs> What's okay? Uh, I was a- really into Tiger Bomb there for a minute. I'm trying know? to think of the dumbest thing after I did. workouts, and then just rubbing that all over the so, muscles. So that stuff I do actually doing that, that Tiger stuff, Bomb, remember that? Yeah. That stuff the, actually works, but it doesn't work in the way that people that, that's think being it works. Applied. Yeah. yeah, people think you you rub it on a targeted area and it like it like goes through the skin. Yeah, it penetrates to the, the bone skin layers and, then and it yeah. doesn't go, it doesn't go that deep. It doesn't even go beyond the the top. That was their whole marketing yeah. is that it goes super deep. No, it doesn't do that. What it does do is it it because it causes a sensation on the skin because it it, it the chemicals the chemical composition of things like menthol stimulate the nerves and cause a sensation of cold or hot or whatever. You're not actually cold or hot. But it tricks your body into feeling that. And what happens is because the central nervous system is getting the signal and perceiving it to be cold or hot, it interrupts and confuses the, the pain signal. So it's not like curing the pain or reducing inflammation or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It's literally just confusing the signal so then your brain doesn't perceive the pain the same way and you feel relief. So it does work in some cases, just not. The so way okay, and explain yeah. that a little bit more. So you're saying that when you put that like icy hot on, yes. So you're creating a new pain that your <laughs> your your central nervous well, system is is responding to. And why to. why that would work is because when you get pain somewhere, right? Like your body automatically is going to send fluid there, right, to recover because it, it's, well, it senses that it's it's in, not even it's pain. Injured. It's not even pain because when you rub it on, it doesn't hurt. It just feels cold. But what it does? No, I mean an area that you're having. Pain. Oh right, right. You have pain there. Yeah, and that's the the body's natural response is to send fluid there, right? Inflam- inflammation or inflammatory markers. Yeah, yeah, right. So that's what it does. So by putting this on there, it creates this cooling process. Is that what you're saying? It, no, it, it makes you perceive. Well, so, yeah, okay, you, so here's, I mean. here's an example. Here's an example. You ever chew um, like mint gum or wintergreen gum and then you breathe in and it feels so cold in your mouth? Yeah. Or you drink like a cold Coke or something and freeze the shit out of your mouth? It's not actually cold. It's not making your mouth cold. It's just hmm. making you perceive your mouth to be cold. So it's not actually doing anything other than creating this perception. So when you're rubbing these lotions or creams or whatever on your skin for pain, because it's sending a signal to your brain and making it perceive differently, it actually can interfere with or confuse, if you will. That's a bad word, but it's it's interfering with the signal of pain. So then your brain perceives the pain a little differently and for a lot of people, that could mean less pain. Mm-hmm. So, like, we have this. So, my girlfriend has this. Maybe talked about this on a podcast. She has this green oil that uh, she got in because she used to travel with the uh, Cirque du Soleil, and so she'd go all over the world. And when I first met her, she would get migraines sometimes, and she had this little tiny bottle of this really potent green oil with all this Chinese writing on it, and she'd dab it and put it on her head, and she said it made her headache go away. And I remember thinking, like, that's bullshit. And she was like, no, it literally makes the migraine. 
she's like, it's still there. I can still feel my head throbbing, but I don't have the pain anymore. And then it came to me. I'm like, oh shit, you're interrupting. You're, you're confusing the signal. Mm. So I did a little research and that's exactly what those things do. So they well, do. That makes me think about foam rolling as being, yes. like, you know, it's a very similar concept. <laughs> yes. And that's why I was, it's almost like you're localizing a different area of your body for, you know, your, your body to respond to mm-hmm. like, <clears throat> it's sensation wise so it's it's a similar the similar way that i think uh and i believe western science will explain acupuncture this way eventually but i think acupuncture works the same way i don't think that there's a chinese chi energy that's flowing through the body and you're you know those blocked areas of chi and you got to loosen it up but I, I think that's the way they explained it that's how they mm. they use their language but what i think is happening is i think you're literally interrupting or confusing signals to your brain so that you then perceive pain differently now does that mean it's going to heal you faster perhaps the same way massage may might might right because if you're walking and moving a certain way because of pain now you don't feel anymore now you can move and walk differently or whatever and you're no longer causing the problem or maybe causing the you know whatever the root issue is that's causing the pain so maybe it's a long-term you know benefit as well but if you consider the central nervous system is responsible for so many things then I could see how acupuncture and these types of you know things may actually right. have an effect. Well, that, that, well, to me, that makes a lot of sense when you, especially when Justin brings up the foam rolling and what we know about that mm-hmm. and what we used to think about that. Right, we used to tell people you're breaking up knots, but in in reality, it's more of a central nervous thing that's going on more than anything else. So. Well, yeah, and like I'll have people who will have like they'll feel their knee pain, have a foam roll, do a couple stretches, now walk. Oh, my knee pain's gone. You're such a miracle worker. And it's like, well. I don't think I got rid of the problem. And sort of band-aided it. Exactly. Yeah. But I think a lot of the pain relief is because we're, you know, kind of changing the signals that we're... Because pain is all perception. Mm-hmm. It's 100%. If you really think about it, like, have you ever done this to yourself where you hurt? And all you think, the time. And you don't hurt until you look at it. And then you look at it and it's like, oh, it hurts yeah. so much worse yeah. when you see blood gushing out, right? Once you see the blood gushing out, all of a sudden the pain comes. So they do this famous experiment. Which it's so fucking awesome. You can look it up on YouTube. Well, doesn't uh, was it Walter Longo who does who talked about this, or who was the guy who talked about it with the whole snake biting you in the ankle? Was oh it, yeah, who was, who it? was it? So yeah. there, so you can look this. It's very similar to what I'm about to say. So you can look up this was a TED study talk. on uh, or as a TED talk. You can look it up online. But they'll have a bunch of uh, subjects or people wearing these like virtual reality glasses, and when they put them on. They look down at their body and they see uh, this doll. So they they start they look down at their legs and they have little doll legs or whatever. Because what they did is they hooked up a camera in front of a doll, looking down at itself. So when you look inside the VR and you look around, everything looks the same except when you look down at yourself, you look like you're like this little doll, right? And so that's what you see. So then what happens is a a researcher, and they have you barefoot and everything. A researcher will come over and they'll tickle your foot with a like a feather while tickling the doll's foot with a feather. So when you look through the VR glasses, you see these little doll legs getting tickled with a feather, but then you feel that you're getting tickled with a feather. Oh, shit. And what happens is your brain, very quickly, you can do this on yourself if you could get the setup. You could actually do this to yourself. Your brain very quickly uh, connects to the doll and perceives that the doll is you. Yeah. So then they'll do all these things to the doll's leg while they're doing it. What a fuck up! Scene. What a fuck up! To, to, to chop the leg. Uh, that's what they do. Yeah, yeah. It's like a voodoo doll. That's what they do. Yeah. That would be so it's fucked, fucked up. up you, so, just, uh, you get tickle you with a feather, then also I take a butcher knife and just go whack. That's, right that's, your that's, ah! that's what they do. So they do all these things. And really? That's a yes, fucked up. And trick. you're feeling like you're feeling your leg being touched, but you see this doll's leg being touched as you look through these VR glasses. <laughs> And you don't even realize that you're totally connecting to it. Except when you're a Ken doll and you have no nuts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then they take a knife and then they pretend to stab the leg so people kind of flinch and go, oh my God, this is so weird, ah, whatever. And then they actually hit the leg. People freak out. <laughs> and when they interview them afterwards, they say, literally, for a split second, I felt you cut my leg. Yeah. Like how fucking weird yeah, is that, that is shit? really weird. Yeah. Well, well, they did that same experiment split with like a, a false arm. Oh, yeah. On the other side. And, and they put a camera the on it. Yeah, and they hit the hammer on the hand. And so, yeah, you're looking at it like you see, like it's it becomes your hand. Well, like so what is it. so think about this. Like, what does that tell us right, that about that's pain? A, that's trippy. You yeah, know how many times your mind, how many times people go because there are real reasons for pain. There's definitely, you know, you can definitely have. An imbalance, well, it serves you, injury, right? right, swelling, whatever. You can have real root causes of pain, but a lot of pain is connected to our own perception and emotion. And you know, when people are like, uh, 
like people will go get massage or whatever and they'll get emotions released from having body work or whatever and some people will say oh that's ridiculous and hokey no it's actually legit i've had clients who have worked through emotional issues and all of a sudden no more back pain no more shoulder pain or whatever mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as a result of it i actually had a client who i worked with for a long time on her shoulder pain initially when i worked with her horrible imbalances definitely some issues we corrected it all to the point where when we would work out, I wouldn't even see an imbalance anymore. I'm like, your shoulder's working well. Like, everything's working well. I was very confused as to what was going on, why she still felt this pain. She went to the doctor, MRI, everything. Everything came back normal. And so we started talking about these potential emotional connections to pain. And one of the questions I asked her, I said, how long have you had the shoulder pain? And she said, oh, for the last four years. And she used to be very active. And it prevented her from being active. And I said, well, how did that make you feel? And she's like, it felt horrible. I felt like I was forced to not do the things that I love to do. Mm -hmm. And so she had this very strong, visceral, emotional connection to the shoulder that fucked up her life, basically, right? And so I said, I wonder how much of this is you perceiving. And here's the thing. People want to hear that because they think you're saying it's not real. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's real. You feel it. The reason You feel it, so it's real. It doesn't really fucking matter if there is a physical cause or not. You feel it. And the funny thing is, after like a couple months of having these conversations and kind of working through stuff, she literally just, it clicked and the pain went away. It was so weird, like literally just disappeared. And then it would kind of creep back and then she'd realize that maybe she's perceiving or whatever and then it would go away again. It's a very, very interesting uh, experience. Yeah. But uh, doctors uh, will prescribe things like antidepressants for back pain that has no you know, cause that they can see. And sure enough, people will respond to antidepressants and have no back pain. Hmm. I mean, how fucking weird is that shit? Yeah, it's a trip. I love it. I, I mean, I love this kind of stuff because I think it's um, it's great because our industry tends to be, or at least the the. It's not as straightforward as yeah. as, as you always perceive it to be, and I think that's important that people don't just. I mean, you can get examples and you can kind of make these uh, ideas of where where you think you know like like this concepts come from like, but a lot of times it's more complex than we can even like pinpoint. I think, uh, when we approach things and say things to people like, um, for example, if, if you start to understand this process and you tell someone that, Hey, maybe they're perceiving this pain because of some emotional, whatever, or some connection to it. Like, like make sure you let them know if you're a trainer, like that doesn't mean you're faking it or it's not real or you're trying to get attention. If you feel it, it's real. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Well, so. we try and create analogies to simplify, you mm-hmm. know, things for people. And I, I think that's half of what we try to do even to to be able to communicate it better. But a lot of times, <laughs> it, like, there, there's just so many different factors that, um, you know, you could keep going down this rabbit hole with. It makes me realize as a trainer to, because I was guilty of this a lot, especially when I first became a trainer, of not really believing my clients sometimes. Right. Yeah. You guys ever do that? Yeah. Oh, a lot. Of, I think I feel like an asshole. Well, <laughs> I think sometimes because of that. A lot of what we talk about on this show, and and also why we're so passionate. I mean, recently we just defended uh, Paul Check on a question, and I feel like why that is is because I don't know how many times I was wrong, man. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many times that you know what my client was saying to me or what I was you know mathematically adding up it should this is what should be happening it wasn't true there was always there's always seems to be this exception to the rule you know more often than not too i think that was what was surprised me after you've been doing this for as long as we have you've met you know hundreds of cases where it's just like man just none of the things that i was taught or that i was told added up for this person and it didn't work there was so much more going on so much to the point where i at least in my experience uh, so so much of the results were psychological, like as far as them uh, getting to the point or getting to their goals, there was so much work to be done um, up in their head before their, the physical part, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and, and I think when, as a trainer, that was a major, uh, you know, uh, me evolving was learning that and putting that together and going, man, I was so focused on the the uh, X's and O's of training. And once I, I learned to kind of let that go a little bit and figure out that, wow, there's so much more that I can help this person with their relationship with themselves, their relationship with exercise, their relationship with food. And as I could start to put that together, things would, everything else would start to come together. Mm-hmm. But it took, a, a, it took a lot of those cases, like you're saying that, where 
I was wrong or I couldn't put a figure it out. Like, this doesn't make sense. You must be lying to me or this can't exactly. be true. Like, yeah, yeah. I know we're working fucking hard. Yeah, if I worked this hard, I would be seeing these kind of results. sneaking candy bars, I swear. Dude, yeah. I used to get really mad at clients and I'd think they were lying. And I feel so bad because looking back, like I'd, I'd have people tell me like, Sal, but I'm only eating 1,200 calories. I'm not losing weight. I'm like, you're full, you're full of shit because yeah. you're doing this. And you, now, of course, I know that, man, the metabolism can adapt. And slow down so Dude, much. Do you want to hear a trip? Check out, check, yep. to, check out what happened to me this weekend. So I shared with you guys maybe, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe a month ago on, on Mind Pump that I had an old client slash friend of mine and Katrina's that was getting ready for a show. And she had hired me a couple of years, I think like two years ago to coach her. And, um, you know, she wanted to get ready for a show that's been on her bucket list. Like, I want to compete. And so <clears throat> it was in the heart of me competing and, and uncoaching. And she's like, you know, I'd like to do this. And I said, well, you know, she wanted to pick a show. And I told her, you know, listen, the real work is done in the off season and we need to prepare you mentally and physically before we ever even decide and pick a show. And I was really adamant about that. And she was a friend of mine. So I was like, I think whether she liked it or not, this is how we're going to do it. Like, I remember you telling the story. Right, right. I've shared this with you guys. Mm -hmm. So her show, her first show was this weekend. Oh, she competed. She competed and she hired somebody else besides me, right? Mm. And now, mind you, I'm not coaching anymore or doing that. So, uh, and she would have loved to have been coached by me, but I still wouldn't have let her because I know that she wasn't ready yet. She hadn't put the work in mm -hmm. uh, long enough and consistent enough to build a good solid frame, a good solid metabolism to get her ready for a sport this extreme of, of cutting, right? But she did it anyways. And she competed, and she uh, she looked good. She looked uh, she looked better than we had got her to uh, when I had her trying to build her metabolism. We never went on a hard, real cut. I was always trying to fix her metabolism mm -hmm. and, and and put some good lean body mass on her. And the the most uh, I think the lowest that I ever got her down to was about fifteen percent body fat. And even at that point, I still didn't want her to do a show yet. So fast forward to now. So she does this show. Well, what she decides to do is day before she gets on stage, she goes to get her body fat tested, but she tells the guy that tells Aaron, don't tell me. I don't want to know what it is until I don't want it to fuck with me while I'm on stage, mm -hmm. but I do want to know I'm in the best shape of my life. So I want to see where, where I'm at. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she, and she wants to open it up with me and Katrina. We, we go there and she's like, Hey, she's like, um, she already got on stage and she's like, I, oh, I've been I waiting to open up my body fat test with you guys and go over it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm like, great, let's do it. You know? So she was down, uh, from the weight that she was with me, 25 pounds. So she lost 20, so her total body wow. weight. Yeah. Total body weight. So her total body weight, she was, uh, so she walks around normally at about 155 around that range. And so she was down to like one, what is that? Uh, math. Like one, 130 or something. Yeah. Like that. Right around there. Right. A little lower than that. I think even. So she lost 25 pounds during this this prep, and we open it up, and uh, she's looking over it. And I saw I I'm so used to looking at Aaron's dunk thing, so I saw the body fat percentage right away. And she's like kind of searching for it, and I catch it, and then like I was like my face, I was like, oh shit, hey. right? And I don't yeah. say anything. I let her kind of she finds it, and she's like, is this right? I'm like wait, that's not right. And I go, yeah, no, it's right. And she's like, I don't understand. And I'm like, well this is what happens when you cut this extreme. So he had her up to three session, three bouts of cardio a day for, for her 10 week prep. She Jesus didn't have, Christ. she didn't have any fruit. Holy so no fruit shit. for, for 10 weeks. She, uh, had st the very first week right out the gates was doing an hour of cardio plus reducing calories. I think she had her, uh, less than 1500 calories at one point, uh, and up to three hours of cardio every single day Jeez. plus all of her training. And uh, she came in at 17.5% body fat. She actually high, well, because she lost shit tons of muscle. So she got on stage and competed. That's got to be eye opening. At a higher body fat percentage than what I With had. All her, that work. When I had her eating 2,600 calories. Okay, 2,600 calories and no cardio mm -hmm. and tra and weight training. Who is this fuck stick coach? Well, you, want, you should shout out, give him a nice little yeah, shout out. It's, 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 a, it's a, a, actually a big name pro guy out of New York that coaches a ton of people. He came highly recommended for someone else to her. Oh, my God. And You're an idiot. So, and more yeah. than any, what was great, though, <laughs> You was, sir suck. I, and I, and what I might do, so I and I told her this that she's actually she's actually going to come in today. So you guys are going to see her today. Oh, okay. She's going to come by today, and I'm going to talk to her about helping her, uh, you know, come out of Repair this. Prepare that. Yeah, yeah, because this is what happens, and this is what's really scary for. Her. And she looks great. So if you look, I mean, she's 25 pounds less. So she's the smallest mm -hmm. she's been in forever, right? So mm -hmm. she's 
a weight wise. Oof, yeah, but the, know, the rebound, you got to be careful now. Yeah, right. So can you imagine that it, you lost all that lean body mass? But that's the trap. Yeah, where all these competitors get into. I look so great, dude. And, and you, yeah, it's it's important they see that the hormone changes, the metabolism changes, the changes to uh, everything from you know production of catecholamines to the receptors that these catecholamines attach to. I mean, you're in a such a da- damaged state. Coming out of that is so crucial because the the what your body, what our body's going to want to do, is blow up like in a big way to the where it's going to be very difficult to get back to where she was before. Oh yeah, no, this is there's, and this is happening all over by you know and. When you lose that much weight, and she looked good. So if you look at her pictures, the average person would see that and they would be like, oh my God, they were all, everyone's so proud of her, you know, they, yeah. which they should be. I mean, she disciplined herself for that long and she busted her ass to lose all that weight to get on stage. And she looked smaller than she's, you know, ever really looked in the last 10 plus years. And so imagine like if you were somebody who didn't get tested, didn't have uh, the resources of someone like me who had tracked her body fat before. And because I had her do all that stuff when we when we were when we were coaching. And this is exactly why I don't think that people should get ready and go do a show just to do a show because there's so much work that needs to be done to your metabolism and and your lean and your mass before you you want to have a bunch of good lean mass mm-hmm. and then you want to do it very slow and strategically and this is what happens a lot of these competitors they and then and then and then they get on stage and they see themselves lean or smaller than they've ever been and in their head they think I'm in great shape mm-hmm. you know I'm in good shape they think but really you got fatter yeah. I mean could it that doesn't register for a lot of people that you could lose 25 pounds and actually get fatter so people don't understand why so if you took um Let's say I'm walking around at my, so I'm a hundred and I don't know how much I weigh right now, 190 something. And let's say I'm 9% body fat. So 9% body fat, uh, or let's just say 10%. And let's say I weigh 200 pounds. So I got 20 pounds of body of fat on my body. If you took that, if I lost 50 pounds of muscle, but kept 20 pounds of fat on me, my body, even though I didn't gain any body fat, my body fat percentage went up because now it's a greater percentage of my overall body weight. And this is what may happen. She may have, in fact, she may have less total pounds of fat on her body at this much lighter weight, but because she lost so much muscle, however much body fat she has is now a greater percentage of her body weight than it was before, well, which is not a, well, I not gave, a good thing. I, I gave her the, the equation this. I said, you lost 25 pounds, right? And of that 25 pounds, uh, at least 15 of it was actually muscle. 10 of it was fat. So you lost 10 pounds of fat, which is why you feel better, right? 10 pounds of fat yeah. came off your body. Yeah. So your waist and your legs and your arms and areas that you had body fat, you feel better. But what you don't realize is 15 pounds of muscle also came off. Mm-hmm. And people are probably going like, how the fuck does that happen to somebody who's lifting weights and training and well, eating good food? Let's see. And you're, this is, you're just like keep hammering that signal for cardiovascular yes. endurance and style training. You're That's telling it. your body to become yeah. efficient with calories. Get rid of mass. It's trying to become yeah efficient with calories and the think about it this way you're spending three hours a day in the gym doing cardio you're feeding yourself very little and you're doing maybe an hour of resistance training which your intensity is probably bad because you, you can't train hard because your calories are low you're doing so much cardio so you are sending a signal to keep some muscle but the the signal that's overriding all of that has become very efficient which your body tried to do by losing 10 pounds of muscle it just adapted in that direction. It slowed itself down. Well, I don't think it, it's an equal one to one. But when you think about it like this, to me, it's almost obvious. Like if you're spending more time doing cardio than you are lifting weights, what do you think is going to become more right. of a priority? Yeah. I mean, to me, it's kind of obvious like that. It's like That's- if I'm spending more time on a treadmill than I am in the weight room, then the signal I'm telling my body is well, obviously- even then I would guarantee that the the weight training itself. I mean, there's probably like barely any rest. Yeah, of course, sets, you know of course. I mean? I'm it's sure it's all cardio. I didn't even, yeah, I didn't even ask Circuit for that. I didn't have based. to. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I know like everything he was doing already was ridiculous. These coaches and, are uh, morons. Yeah, yeah and well, and he, the it's reason why I wanted to share so bad with you guys was that you know people don't put this together because they see the the smaller frame. Like, and yeah. had she not done her body fat test, 
there's a good chance. It's a good thing she did. That she would connect that this is the best shape she's ever been yep. in her life. And, and this is what strive it- strive to get back Yes, yeah. and this is what it takes to get there, mm. when in reality, it couldn't be far, further from the truth. So yeah. so I'm going to say something- I'm, I'm going to say something a little controversial here with this because, uh, but it needs to be said, in that competing on stage and doing what it, you know, doing these kinds of things uh, is bad for anybody. It's bad for men and for women, but it's worse for women. It's worse for women because the female body uh, didn't evolve, it evolved needing a certain amount of fat on its body, and a woman's hormones get affected in a very, very big way. Uh, with extreme dieting and extreme exercise, more so than a man's, and they take longer to recover. Um, and this is evident. Look, you can see this in female athletes who get too lean. They lose their period. A man is fertile. A man's always going to be fertile. I mean, you have to do a lot of bad shit to a man's body to cause it to stop producing sperm, but a, a woman will lose her period just getting too lean. Um, they find this with fasting. Although fasting is healthy for everybody, there are studies that are now demonstrating that women, uh, their ability to fast for long periods of time without negative side effects is lower than a man's. Now, we can speculate why. I mean, you know, we can think, okay, evolutionarily speaking, if, a, if men evolved to go off and hunt, we probably evolved to handle not having food for longer periods of time, looking for food, whereas the women may have stayed back and, you know, foraged and found nuts and roots and seeds or whatever, so they didn't have to necessarily go for longer periods of time. But also the, the female body, much of the reason why she evolved the way she did is to bear children. That's like, I mean, that's, the, that's really the, the defining characteristic of, yeah. of humans is that we procreate, or at least the defining characteristic of evolution is that we procreate. Only th- those of us that procreate are the ones that pass on our genes, and those are the genes that we have now. So if a woman places herself in these kinds of positions, the body senses that this is not a hospitable hospitable situation for pregnancy. Whether you want to get pregnant or not, it just senses that and it will make drastic changes to your body that are very damaging. And so when I've worked with clients, men and women, who both have metabolic damage, 10 out of 10 times, it's easier to get a man to reverse that metabolic damage. Women take a much longer period of time. We just, they did not evolve to build muscle as easy, easily, or just get nearly as lean as we do. And women can get very lean, but again, uh, you know, a guy can get down to 4% body fat and get on stage. If a woman does it, she has to use man, male hormones, and you get all kinds of uh, you know, masculinizing effects and all kinds of weird stuff that happens. So yep. I hope women are listening right now and, and like you really will f- can well, do some serious damage here, to your body. You know, staying on the being controversial or probably offending some people, well, I'm going to just piggyback right <laughs> off of that. Here we go. It, well, and it's it's fresh on my, my mind. My favorite tag team. It's, yeah, it's, or, uh, you just triggered Adam. <laughs> I, well, I just I was I haven't been to a show again since we we stopped by and saw uh, Arya, and we saw him for a, a pro show, so it's different. So I was actually watching NPC, and NPC is- uh, Yeah, you know me. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> NPC is the okay. is the um, amateur level, right? So this is these are all a lot of these people are in you know the first first one to five shows, um, or potentially more if they haven't placed in the top five. Was this it's, like a national qualifier or anything like that? No, no, no. This okay. is no, no. no. The MP, if it's NPC like that, this is at San Jose. Um, well, I don't know if this was a national qualifier. Doesn't matter. It's amateur, okay. right? Okay. So, and I was telling Katrina this while I'm sitting here and I'm watching these girls come out. And the class that my friend was in, uh, I think she had 18 just in her height category alone. The total in the entire bikini class was somewhere between 50 to 70 women. Between the 50 to 70 women that I saw on stage, I can count on one hand how many of them I, I believe their bodies were ready to be competing at that level. And let me let me explain what I mean by that and what's wrong with this fucking sport is... If you were to play, okay, so we are, we've already talked about that competing is the 1% of the 1%ers, right? Like if you're getting on stage, you're like the 1% of the 1% competing at that level, okay? So there's, it's already a very, very small uh, pop, uh, part of the population get into that ridiculously low body fat percentage. That's what I mean by 1% of mm-hmm. the 1%. And then to get on, not only are you uh, a very small percentage of the population, but now you're also getting on stage and competing against others that are exactly your height. So it's a very, very, very small sliver of people that this these they fall in this category. Now, the, very similar to like um, basketball players or football players or baseball players, but there isn't any sort of a... Uh, 
um, filter to get you there. And what I mean by that is anybody in, can sign up for an amateur NPC show and say, I'm going to do a bikini show. And to me, there, that there's a problem with that. I don't think anybody and everybody should be able to to play a sport just because they want to sign up for a sport. Not at that level, because at that level, it becomes dangerous. It becomes dangerous and it becomes unhealthy if you don't know how to play the sport right. And so that's what I look when I and I when I look at these bodies, I, uh, so many of these bodies I saw on stage and I'm going, most of these people, I can tell by their frame and the way they look, they haven't put the fucking work into the gym yet. You haven't even built a physique yet, but you look cute in a bikini. So you think that you should get up on stage and you hired a coach who starved the fuck out of you and ran you on a treadmill for eight weeks, fucking your metabolism up. And you have no idea because you wanted to say, I got up on stage and I competed or you want to get more Instagram likes. And so that I I have a major problem with that. And and people didn't understand when I was getting ready for a show. I remember talking to my peers and they were like, why don't you get on stage now? I mean, you will do well at an amateur show. And I said, well. I haven't, my body, I could not even hang at a pro level. When I was first training to get ready for a show, I trained for a whole year before I even got on stage. So a year I spent building my physique. Now, mind you, I've been lifting weights for 15 years and I still didn't think that I had built a frame that could compete with the 1% of the one percenters. So why would I put myself through extreme dieting to get my get up on stage to present myself knowing that I haven't put the real work in, which is building a metabolism, building a solid frame up before I go shred and cut down like this. Yeah, and really it's just you're you're I mean you're trying to warn people like, you know, it's Here's what I would recommend. I yeah, mean, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying, you know. Be careful because. Uh, Just put the work in. Dude, we've seen some horrible, like horrible shit people have done to their bodies. Yeah. Uh, to the, and they've done it to themselves, you know, through going through this process. I don't know about you, Adam. Let me know what you think about this. But in the past, I've had people ask me, you know, should I compete? And what I've told them is, why don't you train kind of like you're going to do a show but don't actually do a show and take pictures of yourself and just kind of see how you feel rather than going all the way just so you get an idea of what's going on and you can monitor yourself and see what's happening to your body well no 100 percent. that's exactly what i recommend to people is that you know you should prepare yourself or train as if you're going to get ready for a show without the pressure of having to get ready for a show Mm -hmm. because there's a lot more that comes with it and this is what ends up happening right and this is what these coaches do is they take anybody on because they want to take the money right i i want the i want your money so i'll sure pick a show i'll i'll coach you along you know i'll help you out forget that you're not ready for it forget that you haven't put the real work in for your body forget all that shit i'll take your money and you and tell you how to get ready for the next 10 to 12 weeks, which is basically a hard caloric restriction followed by intense training, followed by a ton of fucking cardio. And I know that, uh, you know, any knucklehead can put together that put that together and lose someone a bunch of weight, just like they did my girlfriend. And now she's down 25 pounds. But really, you did a ton of harm to her body. And she has got an uphill battle now, reverse dieting and coming out of this. And it's not as simple as, oh, just add a little bit more calories back, dude, and you'll be fine. Like, no, it doesn't work that way, bro. Not to mention the signals that you get post-show where you start to feed yourself and then you get this, it's ravenous. You get this ravenous hunger to eat. Um, Your body is going to override your logic. I mean, logically... People don't gain 30 pounds in three weeks. You know what I'm saying? Of just and e- of eating just horrible food. This doesn't happen logically, mm. but it happens all the time after these shows on people with small frames. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, when we went to the show, I, I went to. I've been to a few shows, and the thing that always sticks out to me is when you're walking around and you see these, you know, these girls sitting on the floor. Mm-hmm. They look like their faces look like they're dying. Yeah. And they're like they're, skeletons, and they're like chewing on like a dry rice cake, and they don't even have any spit in their mouth because they've probably been restricting water, and uh, it's just like, oh man, what is what's going on here? Well, yeah. it's you're watching you're watching right now what I'm going through with, um, you know, prepping myself like as if I'm going for a show and I'm not. And a lot of people have asked me, are you are you going to compete again? Are you going to do this? I'm like, eh, I don't know. I don't have any real desire to do it. But I will tell you right now that my physique isn't even ready for it. Like, so if I said, hey, I want a show in six or eight weeks, I can get lean enough for a show in six to eight weeks, but I'm not in, I'm not in aesthetic shape 
to compete with the best of the best. So I wouldn't do it. I can, I could, but it wouldn't be smart. Does it make sense? So I, I think that a lot of the the bikini men's physique, a lot because it's growing like crazy. It just blows my mind every time I go to these shows and I see. Was this one look? Did, did this one look massive? Lucrative? Massive. They're huh. they're they're all massive, and there's just hundreds and hundreds of competitors. And it's and it, and I think you know you, you hear uh, when I speak passionately about this, it's not uh, it's it's more cautioning people because I know it's it, the popularity is growing. It's not going the other other direction. And so what I'm talking about is getting worse before it's getting better. And so I think, and somebody asked recently, like, what does a good coach, you know, look like and a good prep look like? Well, before we, we pick on the coaches, you know, I want to address the things that people, people that are listening right now, they can control. If you're even thinking about doing a show and you've never put yourself in shape, and you add to a good enough shape to where you can look at yourself objectively and say, hey, does is my physique aesthetically put together? And what I mean, symmetrical, balanced. Do I have like a judge would look? Yeah, like a judge would look at you, okay? Or like the cover of a magazine. If you have if you look at yourself and objectively say, Where am I at? My body, my muscle mass, if you're not there yet then you shouldn't be even trying to pick a show yet. You should be putting your time and consistency in the gym, training and building a frame and building a solid, good metabolism. Because, And why that's important, not just from aesthetic reasons, it's important for aesthetic reasons because you're getting judged by the way you look and your symmetry. So obviously it's important for that. But even more so, it's important for metabolism. What I'm doing right now, I was just sharing with Sal before we got on the show, and I, I can feel my metabolism picking up. I mean, I'm now uh, losing weight off of 4,000 calories. It only took about four weeks for that of me of getting back into the training volume and increasing all that. But it, that this is all part of the process that I would have to do before cutting. If I were to just start cutting for a show four weeks ago. Oh, man, you'd be down to you know under 2,000 2, calories. Yes, and, yes. For a big guy like And you. I would be starving and my body would be losing muscle mass and I would look terrible. I would feel terrible. So right now, part of me building a frame is also building a metabolism right now. I'm building this roaring met- metabolism that will now allow me to cut down to 3,500 calories, and that will just consistently drop weight. Well, it's no different for women. It's just a different number. Like for me, it's I'm saying numbers like 4,000 calories. Well, you get these female competitors, they hire a coach, and they're only eating about 2,000 calories a day or less. And then they want to get cut for a show. Like, what's he going to cut you to? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. he's he's going to he's going to cut you to fifteen hundred. You're going to lose the first couple of weeks, then you're going to hit a plateau. Then what's he going to do? He's going to drop you to a thousand calories. Then you're going to hit another well, plateau. Let, and let what's me he going ask, to do again? Let me ask you this: uh, When people are are getting ready for a show, let's say they do like typical what twelve weeks, right? Typically, it's a twelve week prep uh, before getting on stage. How, of that twelve weeks, how much of it should feel like shit? In other words. You know, because uh, I know people who prep for a show and all 12 weeks are fucking nightmare. Like, they're exhausted. The last, the last seven to 14 days tops. That's it. Tops. That's it. So if you're listening right now and you've you've done this and your whole 12-week prep was just... Just a, murder hell. Yeah, just yeah. a nightmare. I mean, Not even murder hell. It should feel... You should feel great for most of your prep. Yeah. You should feel great. I can't imagine... You should not feel at all miserable until... In, and, in, and, eight on, and when I say seven to 14 days, I don't... I never was miserable. I mean, the, that's just the hardest. That's when you start to get hard. Yeah, that's when it's like then. That's when I'm like, oh, I'm hungry a lot. You know, like I I really feel like the last seven days or so of heading into prep, and really it's not the last seven because it's the final three. I'm refeeding the body up, so it's like this small window of five to seven days of you know that last bit because really. Mm. The, the healthy, our body is only going to lose about a half a percent to a percent of body fat per week. Okay, so you're talking, and these are all obviously arbitrary numbers. Everybody's uniquely different, but they're, it's a good estimate. It's a good general number. Yeah, to there. give people an idea of what this should look like. You're not losing more than one to two pounds of fat in a week. So when you come to your last couple of weeks, if you don't look about stage ready already, what, the, what you're going to do in the next two weeks is... You're not going to make that much change. Yeah. Other, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to kill your metabolism, though, by cutting even harder and pushing even harder inside on the treadmill and and training hell intense and reducing calories. You're going to do more harm than you're really going to do good. You can't possibly lose that much more 
body fat in that last week or two. So you should already be shaping up the way you should be getting on stage well before that. And what sucks with this whole this whole mentality is then when, you know, like if I go to coach people and luckily, and I don't coach very more, many people and I've never coached anyone for a show and I refuse to mainly because I don't have any experience doing it. Uh, you know, so I, I wouldn't be a great coach for it, but also because, um, I, I just refuse to, to get someone to a level that I know or do something that I know isn't necessarily good for them. Okay. But the tough thing is then when you're working with people and you're working and it's three months, now you've been working with them for three months, you're like, you know, uh, I don't, my, the weight hasn't really come down that much, you know, and you have to explain to them what's going on because, they were so brainwashed to under to 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 think that you get these crazy results right off the bat, and that uh, that people it's all about short term, it's all about what's happening right now and not the long term. And luckily, people know me through the show, so they know what my my mentality is and my philosophy. So I don't get too much of that, but I still get questions, and I can't imagine trying to be a coach who doesn't have a podcast where people know this. Someone hires them, and then they say, "Okay, cool, check this out." You're not going to lose any weight for about six months. You're not getting any clients. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's almost like you have to do the shitty stuff to keep people happy. Otherwise, you're not going to, you know, build a business. And it becomes, it's, it's very difficult. It's tough. Mm-hmm. It's tough for people. And it's almost like, whose fault is it? You know what I mean? I mean, who's to blame? Is it the coaches and the trainers or is it right. the people right. who pay for this and who demand it? And then, you know, are, they're happy when they get it. And then when they don't get it, they're not happy. Right. You know, like- well, we we had a, a question in the Q and I don't know if we will get to it and answer it. Um, but a girl did ask me, like, you know, what what I thought a you know I, I talk all this like this is all the bad, bad, bad. Well, what's a good coach look like? Well, honestly, I I I don't blame the coaches as much because there's I feel like a competitor should know what's good or bad before you hire a coach to get mm-hmm. ready for a show. Uh, whether that be through that's list- a good that's actually an interesting point. So you're yeah. saying, don't go into it so blind and ignorant that you just do whatever the coach tells yeah. you because you don't know. Yeah, it. they're going to try and get you to look whatever best you know they can in that short amount of time that you're giving them. Yeah, so you're giving them that amount of time. Exactly. Yeah. It's a great point right there, Justin. And that's why I you can't get that mad at these bad quote unquote coaches because. You hired them. You gave them a show that you're going to do in in eight to twelve weeks. He's going to try and get you as small as possible for that show, mm-hmm. and he's going to be looking at you week to week. And when he sees you hitting a plateau, he's going to make adjustments. And he only has a handful of things that he can do, mm-hmm. which is reduce calories, add cardio, or pick up intensity. Those are his three tools that he has in his bag. That's it. And when you and when you give him a time frame. He's going to do that. And so is it really the bad coaches or is it the bad, you know, uh, bikini men's physique athletes that are hiring these coaches that really don't belong competing at this level yet? And, and this is That's why... That's what you got to ask yourself. Yeah, and this is why my advice, you know, has has been rather more recently as I've evolved as a trainer to try to teach people... Uh, that when their motivation behind their training and their nutrition is uh, that they love themselves and love their bodies, they tend to make decisions that are long-term beneficial. And they tend to make less decisions that are short-term beneficial versus I hate my belly, I hate my legs, I hate my, you know, whatever, my arms. So I'm going to go in the gym and say, I hate these things about myself. And it's a very powerful motivator. It'll get you in the gym. If you hate yourself enough, it will. But the decisions that you'll make, are mo- because they're motivated by hate, are going to be ones that are short-term, not long-term. The ones that get you out of pain now uh, rather than later. So it's going to be more you're, – you're, if you go to the gym – like if I go to the gym and I hate my body and I hate my legs and I hate the way they look and I'm tired. you know, I'm, going, I'm like, God, I'm so stiff. I'm so tired. But I fucking hate my legs. I hate the way they look. They're so fat. Uh, I'm going to beat myself up in the gym. I'm just going to go crazy and go hard today because I hate myself so much versus, you know, God, I love my body. I really want to take care of it. Uh, I really want to nourish it. I'm really tired today. I think I need a low intensity day. I think I need to go in and just really take care of myself. Two very different decisions based because the motivation was very different. And, you know, I had a client years ago, good, good friend of mine. She's actually a, a trainer now, an excellent trainer, but before she was a trainer, she was a client. 
and she was uh, just a workhorse. She could do, she could put her mind to anything, and that was part of her weakness, one of her detriments, is that she could just outwork anybody. So she got to the point where she was running 10 miles, uh, 5 to 10 miles every single day, plus weights every single day, plus she was doing Pilates, plus she was doing bar classes, plus she was taking yoga classes, and so she was super active all the time. And she would get skinny and lean, but not as lean as she wanted to. And I would have these conversations with her and say, look, you you need to reduce the amount of activity. It's like, this is insane. You're you're active at a pretty high intensity for hours and hours of every day. Your calories are really low. And you, the only, st- you know, what you keep doing to try and get leaner is increase your activity or decrease your calorie. I mean, at some point you're going to hit a wall. There's nothing, no, you're not gonna be able to go any further. Right. And we'd have this conversation, this debate about this and we'd go and go and go. Well, she ended up becoming my workout partner for a little while. So we ended up working out together. And because she was hanging around me so much, she started finally kind of trusting what I was saying and adopting what I was saying. And little by little, she reduced her activity. And the reason why that's a good thing is if she just reduced her activity point blank, she would, you know, gained a shit ton of weight. So she took her time and started focusing more on resistance training and started increasing her calories. And it took a little over a year. It took a little over 12 months of doing this to where, you know, she came to me and she goes, I can't believe it. She goes, I'm doing no cardio, barely. I'm just going for walks with my friends. I'm lifting weights with you and I'm leaner I, I feel amazing. I've got way more time on my hands and I'm eating more food. She's like, this is crazy to me. She's like, I didn't realize it. Like, there's no way I'm not burning nearly as many calories. And I said, that's not true. You forget that your body's ability to burn calories isn't just dependent on, on activity. It'll burn it on its own and it'll, it'll prefer, d- depending on what adaptation signals you're sending, to have more muscle, less muscle, to burn more calories, less calories. And that's really the determining factor. The amount of activity that you do uh, and the calories that you eat when you drop them so low will give you immediate results, but in the long term, your body adapts. It's very effective at doing this. It can adapt to tremendous... I'll tell you what. You, they did studies on prisoners of war. These are you know men who got captured by the enemy and were fed you know 200 to 300 calories a day. And yes, they looked like death, but they survived on like hundreds of calories a day, a couple hundred calories a day. Human body has an incredible ability to adapt. Mm. And so I want people to who are listening, it will take longer. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to be honest. It's going to take longer to do things right. You're not going to get in shape for the summer. You know what I'm saying? Doing it this way. Like, oh, I have a month to get in shape for the beach. It's not going to work that fast. Uh, you'll be better off doing the crash diet shit for 30 days. But if you want to deal with this problem for the rest of your life and make it harder for yourself as you get older, every year it'll get harder and harder. I promise you. Oh, every absolutely. year yep. you're gonna get you're gonna store more and more body fat. Every year you're gonna get closer and closer to having health health issues as a result, whether it's you know something severe like autoimmune or just you know uh, chronic fatigue syndrome or whatever. You're gonna cause those problems first. Or or you can ask yourself every time you go to the gym, I'm gonna do the things that I want to do for my body because I love my body. And every time you take a bite, every time you sit in front of food, is this food nourishing me? Forget about weight gain, weight loss. Is this nourishing me? Is this what my body wants to be healthy? Is this how I would feed my child who I love? Uh, which, by the way, sometimes you do that, it's easier because we can do things for our kids that we tend to be blind for ourselves, right? Would I feed my kid this way? Would I tell my kid to, to restrict their calories like this? Would I... Talk to yourself this way. It might take you a year. It might take two years. But here's the result of that. Uh, effortless. Effortless lean. Effortless muscle. Health. It'll be, you'll just walk around and exude it. It'll be who you are. And I promise you it's possible. It's possible to get there. It just takes long time. It takes a while. You got to be cool with it. You got to stop fucking hating yourself. But when you get there, boy, is it fucking awesome. It's it's a great place to be because it's no longer – imagine – think about this right now. For those for those of you who are, this is resonating with, think about this right now. How much of your day, how much of your week, how much of your months, how much of your life is consumed with worrying about how you look, worrying about you have to take in so little calories, I have to work out all these hours because I hate the way I look. 
How much of your life is consumed with that? Now think about how much of time that takes away from your friends, your family, your personal development, your growth as a human being. You are literally creating all, all this is all a detriment to your life. Now think of mm-hmm. when you eliminate all that, when you eliminate that incredible stress and worry and, and, and just, it just consumes your day. Eliminate that. What can you do now? What are you capable of doing now? Uh, and uh, you would be, you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked at who you become through going through this process and doing it the right way. But give yourself some fucking time. Give yourself a little patience because it does take a little while. Well, when, when we talk about contest prep type stuff, it's it's funny because it reminds me a lot about um, when we first came out and we talked about um, CrossFit. And so everybody was like, oh, Mind Pump doesn't like CrossFit or we're anti. I'm like, no, dude, I actually really love CrossFit. I like CrossFit. And it's a very similar relationship that I have with bodybuilding. They're both sports. And they're both for elite level athletes. They really are. And the biggest problem I have with both of them is people that aren't ready for it doing it. That's it. I mean, I think there's definitely some dudes that are amazing and girls that are amazing to watch do CrossFit. And I'll tell you right now, the ones that are what we're watching on TV that are killing it, those people were they have been training their whole life and they most of them are genetically built for it and it's the same thing goes for bodybuilding when you see some of these like specimens up there and just amazing physiques they didn't do that after a one or two shows they've been training for a very long time to get that way and so i i have i have a problem with doing bodybuilding, doing CrossFit to get in just good shape, which is what the average person signs themselves up for either one of those. Now, what do you, you feel it's a problem like having this new category of physique and some of these bikini uh, categories where it seems like that's a lot more achievable and it's almost like they can achieve a certain look by just pretty much starving themselves versus, you know, building up like the, the bodybuilders of old really had to, you know, put in the time to, to build and develop that size. Well, what, what I'm seeing is, and what I saw at least last night, what I saw was the girls that took, so there was a class, like for example, the, the class that my, my girlfriend was in, uh, there was a class of 18, I believe for her, her height and the top five girls, they all looked like they had been training for a while. All the rest of them for the most part, didn't Mm -hmm. so it's still you're you're, they're probably you're not going to win a show that way you're not going to come in just by starving the body and win a show unless you genetically have it already right because some we know we all know girls that have got these just symmetrical bodies have a mesomorph kind of type to them already Mm -hmm. and then if you shred that girl down and diet her she's going to look pretty good on stage so again we always talk about genetics play the number one role right so if if you're genetically built to be a bodybuilder and you just you know cut down really hard you could get on stage and actually do pretty well but what i saw was a lot of you know cute girls that look cute in a bathing suit that you know decided to sign up for a show and compete with these other girls Mm -hmm. and the ones that take the the trophies and win uh, have obviously put the work in now adam i don't have the experience in this world like you do not even close but uh, i'm gonna make a speculation and let me know if you think i'm on the money with this i would say because you're we're, we're talking a lot about being ready physically uh for these shows but would you say that Oh, the mental side. Yeah, yeah, a bigger piece would be oh. would be being ready mentally. Hundred percent. Because, because 100%. I could imagine someone. I feel who, like that's the biggest mental sport there is. Dude, think about it. Imagine if you're a person going into because I know. Look, I had body image issues when I first started lifting weights. Boy, if I competed in bodybuilding, how much worse they would have been. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, having somebody Let, judge and evaluate you, like, and, and you're putting yourself out there. You're already insecure, and they're just hammering on things that you know that they're pointing out that you're already insecure about. That's that's a mind fuck. That's my, what I'm thinking. What, what's his name? Insecurities uh, are more prevalent in bodybuilding than I think any other sport I've ever seen. Yeah, for sure. I mean. Most of what can, most of what these these guys and girls, uh, what drives them to keep going is that is that insecurity of not looking a certain way or wanting something so bad. So, yeah, no, the so it's like you have to have you should have a healthy. I mean, ideally, right? Uh, God, they'd have like no competitors if this. Uh, yeah, that, that, but that, you you should go in having 
healthy body image issues. Well, let's healthy be, connection. We're to talking to we're talking to mind pump people. You know what I'm saying? There's gonna there's gonna, there's plenty of idiots that are gonna continue to do that, and they're gonna their their business will thrive. Yeah. NPC IFBB is mm-hmm. not gonna go anywhere. WBFF, all those federations are gonna do just fine, regardless of what mind pump has to say. But I hope that I can I can impact some of our listeners uh, positively. That I love the sport, so I sound like I'm I'm bagging on it because I love it. I might do it again. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like there's, I do just like I I feel like I talk about CrossFit is that I think there's a lot of cool things about it. It's just I think what's happening is a lot of people are trying to do it for the wrong yeah. reason. They have a misguided view of what it takes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have a, I have an idea. What if God, this may there may even be a market for this where people who get ready for shows they hire a coach who does their Obviously, their training and their you know their diet and stuff, but then they hire someone who they can check in with, who they give the ultimate power to, where they say, "Look, if I start to get if my image if my body image issues get too bad, if I get if I start to if psychologically you see that I need to back off, or I need to stop, or I need to eat more, or whatever, I need your input. It might even be wise to have a second person who that's their job, like they're the ones that are like, okay, my go- my goal is to make sure you stay healthy." And my goal is to make sure that you go into this and come out of it without horrible, you know, horrible psychological issues or 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 even damage to your body afterwards. There may even be. Well, I would hope that. I mean, the coach we, should be able to do that. We, but. We've kind of created, uh, you know, not intentionally, but we kind of created that in, on the Mind Pump Forum. I mean, we have so many uh, aspiring competitors and current competitors on our forum that you know they use they use the forum as a place for moral support and checking in. What do you guys think? Am I doing this right? So we've kind of created that through Mind Pump already, which is kind of unique. So if you're somebody who's aspiring to compete one day or in contest prep with potentially another coach, I mean, feel free to join in on the forum and and be a part of that mm-hmm. because there I think that's a great place for that. I think it's a little crazy to have to pay two different coaches. I got one coach who's telling me bad shit and then my other coach yeah. who's trying to keep me together. I don't know, man. I'm just I thinking mean, like, what, how could we possibly – because I feel like I could help people, but yeah. you know, doing that. On the flip side, uh, I, I probably would end up telling most people. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> you you know, know don't. Do I this feel and- like you'd be a good coach if, if you you know they're going along the process. You start seeing the signs, and then maybe you, help you, you them. sit them down. Well, even even sort of restricting them from going, you know, entering into the show and like going to the next show. You know, sort of like, well, you know, we're not hitting our markers, and and you're not doing that in a healthy way. So let's let's. Let's draw this out a little further. You know what? What makes it really bad too is that, and what happened. This is uh, happens a lot. Is these coaches, even big name, good coaches, right? That everyone knows really well. They get you know twenty, thirty, forty competitors, you know, per month that are hiring on uh, them for their services. And what ends up happening is the, some of them have great experiences, and the ones that have great experiences typically are the ones that are genetically built for the sport or two um, have built a really good frame and have potential to winning. And the coaches put all this extra F, which is funny. The ones that are most ready to win and do well. Need the least amount of coaching. Need the least amount of coaching, Mm -hmm. but they get the most amount of coaching and help because the coaches see the potential in them and go like, that's a first place winner right there. I'm going to attach myself to him or her because I know they got a winning physique. And then the ones that are getting involved- You mean the pro maker? That probably shouldn't be getting involved are, are getting the least amount of help when those ones- are the ones that are are most at risk and need the most guidance get kind of thrown to the wayside because I'll tell you and I've said this before in the show many times I can look at your physique and tell you if you're ready I can see way before her show I can look at your frame and go like you've got what it takes to place in top five and so can any other really good coach he knows now he ain't gonna say that to you because he wants your money. I would because I don't give a shit. I'm not coaching anymore. So I would look at someone and go like, yeah, I think you're ready to do a show. This is how much you're eating right now. This is how you're not doing any. Oh, yeah, you know, you're ready. You 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 definitely are in a good place 
to try and do something like this. And the, the reverse is true. If you talk to me and told me I'm doing this, Adam, I've done that. And I'm looking at your physique and I'm going like, eh, you're just not there. I would say you're not ready yet. You're not ready for a show, but that's not what's happening. What's happening is we're taking everybody's money yeah. and the ones that I already see have the real potential. I'm putting all my energy in them because they, they're going to represent my and the brand. rest of them. Just like, yeah, just starve yourself. Yeah, exactly. Just the rest keep, of them, just keep running. Just keep yeah. cutting her calories. Keep running. Yeah. Uh, Add more cardio. Uh, cut her just calories. go up there and kind of do your thing. Don't worry. Picture. She'll be no down 25 deal. pounds if I keep starving. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. Christ man. Crazy. Yeah. Everything's a nail when all you have is a hammer. Right. Mm. You know what I'm saying? On the 13th, uh, we are having a free live webinar where- It's an event. Uh, me, Adam, and Justin, and Dr. Brink are literally going to go through our newest MAPS program, which will be released uh, at that point, uh, MAPS Prime Pro. It is the it is a correctional MAPS program that focuses on all the joints and, and parts of the body that nobody else does. So mm. your feet, your ankles- your your hands, your fingertips, your elbows, your neck, your spine, um, and more is is done with this particular program. And what we're going to do is we're going to take you through. This is on the webinar. We're going to take you through assessments, teach you how to do these assessments, and teach you movements to work on these areas. And it's all free. So we're basically giving away a lot of what Maps Prime Pro is. All you got to do is go to MapsPrimePro dot com and register uh, for the webinar. Again, it's absolutely for free. Also, uh, you can find us on Instagram. Well, we like to answer questions from people that ask us on Instagram. It's kind of our favorite social media platform. Our page is Mind Pump Media, and we all have personal pages. Mine is Mind Pump Sal. Adam is Mind Pump Adam. Justin is Mind Pump Justin. And you can check out our producer, Doug, at Mind Pump Doug. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>